Hello. In the previous lecture, we talked about a little bit about what heteroscedasticity was and how to detect it using scatter plots. Um, particularly, we did a scatter plot um, where we looked at the fitted values um, or the, the actual values versus different independent variables. That's one way of, of looking at it. I said an even better way is to look at the residuals versus fits plot um, because that gives you a more concise way of thinking about it. Um, basically, doing lots of plots is a really great idea, but you won't always be able to see all kinds of heteroscedasticity using just the plots. Um, you also sometimes need to have a more formal framework for deciding whether or not you have heteroscedasticity or not, and enter into that our heteroscedasticity test. So we're going to talk about some um, statistical tests for formally deciding whether or not we have evidence of heteroscedasticity. Okay, so let's... Uh, we'll just keep on moving forward. If I can get my computer to function, there we go. And so let's talk about some heteroscedasticity tests. First of all, we kind of have two basic methodologies here. The informal way of looking at residual charts. Okay, it's informal and um, there's, there's some shortcomings. It's not going to catch everything, but I still think it's really, really important to do. It's important to do for a couple reasons. One of those reasons is... Um, especially if you suspect there is heteroscedasticity, you may want to do some, some more digging into finding out where the heteroscedasticity is coming from, and doing some of these plots and charts is a really great way to do that kind of exploratory analysis. The second thing is there are th times you'll catch stuff with the plots that you might miss if you just focus on the tests. So this isn't a, we could do it this way or that way, you know, it's not team plots, team tests, it's both and. We want to do both. Um, second, what we're going to talk about in this um, lecture is a more formal way of doing it using a statistical test. In particular, we're going to bring up two different statistical tests for heteroscedasticity. We're going to talk about how to use them and when to use them. Um, so the first one, which I think is kind of the, you know, the, the Swiss Army knife of um, heteroscedasticity tests, is the bush pagan test for heteroscedasticity. Then we have a little more specific test, I think, the Goldfield quant test, where we're looking at um, whether or not um, groups, so when we have categorical data involved, um, do we have heteroscedasticity across categories? That's what that test is really good for. And so we'll talk a little bit about both of those in just a second. Okay, so the first thing we talk about, always, always, always start by plotting residuals. All right, I know we just had a lecture on that and you know that's, but this is just to me is the first step. Load your data, estimate your model, plot your residuals. And you may want to have done some exploratory analysis and some data visualization before you ever ran your model. I mean, that's, it's a really good idea to make sure you know your data set before you know what you're doing, before you get started. So, but we've got a whole lecture, previous lecture on that. So there we go. Next. Let's talk about the Bush Pagan test. Now, the first thing is there is a library called LM test. Now, the first question you might wonder is so, why is the library called LM test? Well, the first reason is it's doing statistical tests. So, hey, test. Hey, that's cool. But why LM? Well, the Bush Pagan test and the um, Goldfield Quant test um, are both what are called Lagrange multiplier tests. So we're kind of used to this, this there's, there's really three types of you know, statistical tests out there. Um, there's kind of the standard one we're used to where we have um, some test statistic, all right, some sample, we'll call that X bar for one of a better one. That's, our, that's the, whatever we estimated from the sample, we subtract from that some um, hypothesized, um, um, value for the population, so call that mu, and then we divide that by some kind of standard error. All right, and that will have some distribution depending on lots of different things, and then we use that to figure out, well, what's the probability of seeing this, and we, we do it. So this is kind of very standard. That's category one. Category two is a little more complicated. So we're actually going to set up on, in the underlying math a constrained optimization problem. All right, now if you know what a constrained optimization problem is, you might know that one method for solving them is the Lagrange multiplier method. Okay, and it turns out we can use that Lagrange multiplier, which is just a fancy number that we add into the math to make it all work, um, 
at the um, end, we can use that as a test statistic. And it turns out to work pretty well. And so we have this class of statistic test statistics that are Lagrange multipliers. And then I'm about to cheat. All right, so everybody get ready to groan and roll your eyes. The third category is all those all kinds of other types of tests. All right. Yeah, there's more than three, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, things like non-parametric tests and, you know, a few others that I'm just not going to be able to put into a category and I don't want to talk about right now. So there, that's the other category. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know. Not, not a great way to put them into three, but hey, you know, we've got it. So that's what this Lagrange multiplier thing is about. So the LM stands for Lagrange multiplier. Um, we need to load this LM test and then we're going to use the command BP test or bush pagan test. All right, and so we do this bush pagan test and we just simply are going to pass it our model. And the other thing that I want to, to emphasize that I think is really important, make sure you add in this argument, studentized equal true. What that's gonna do is that's gonna give us the robust variant of the bush pagan test. The original bush pagan test is very, very sensitive to um, the normality of the residuals. So the residuals aren't normally distributed, it's not an appropriate test. However, um, subsequent research developed a way to make this test robust to that, and so put that in, okay? Um, so this is the robust variant of the bush pagan test. Now, um, come down here, we have our output, now, the one thing I don't like about R's output is it doesn't give you the null hypothesis. I really, really like it when it gives you the null hypothesis because, you know, things that are like, you know, left, right, this way, that way, you know, either or, sometimes can be hard for me to remember. Prime example in, um, you know, the the um, Star Wars movies, is it fuzzball or fuzz face when um, Princess Leia is talking about um, um, Chewie? And I can't remember. All I remember is that my wife was right and I was wrong, um, but I still can't remember which one it is. How does that relate? Well, here we need to know what the null hypothesis is. And in this case, the null hypothesis is no heteroscedasticity. So the null, H-O, is no heteroscedasticity. Okay. And quick tip, if you don't know how to spell something, just write really, really sloppy and nobody will notice. Okay. Um, in any event, no heteroscedasticity or that the error terms are homoscedastic. All right. Either way, um, generally we say it no heteroscedasticity. And that's the null hypothesis. Here we have a tiny p-value, which means we reject that null hypothesis. And thus, we find strong evidence that there is heteroscedasticity in this data. Okay, well, duh. We looked at the when we looked at the um, um, scatter plots, it was pretty blatantly obvious. Okay, well, yeah, sure. All right, there it is. Uh, we can also think about a theoretical reason why there might be. All right, if I think about this, this is food expenditure versus income. If I have high, if I have very, very low income, what am I? What am I eating? Uh, you know what? I'm eating hot dogs and ramen. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly going to have a whole wide variety of things that I can choose from because I have very low income, very low budget to spend on it. However, if I have a higher income, I've got much wider. I mean, I could have anything from, I could have hot dogs and ramen, but I could also have caviar, right? And so I have this much wider spread of choice because I have higher income and a higher budget for food. And so of course I'm gonna see oh, across individuals more variation. So it kind of, we have a theoretical reason why we might expect to see heteroscedasticity in this um, particular model. Okay, so there's the bush pagan test. We'll move on a little bit. So some important features, this is a large sample test. Um, yes, we talked about the Lagrange multiplier part of this. Um, that's basically how it's calculated. Um, there is, there's a lot of stuff on how to do that. If you want to know more on the math, you can you can send me an email or you can look it up on the web. Next, what about over categorical data? So we've got this Goldfield quant test, which is really great for that because while before we're talking about, let me go back here and show you this guy. 
Um, this one, well, this one is over um, food expenditure is, is, you know, those are the fitted values and the fitted values here are food expenditure. So that's over food expenditure. We could also look at this, if I go back to the previous, um, if you look at the previous lecture in this series, um, it, it looked at it over income, right? Those are continuous variables, not categorical. But what if we have non-continuous variables, some kind of categorical data um, or a factor variable? And in that case, it looks a little bit different um, because here, instead of having a continuum, we really we only have two, two values. So let's first of all, let's think about, well, how do we make this plot? The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make a new variable called median income. And I'm gonna do it quick and dirty, easy. There's Probably lots of better ways to do this. So all the R programmers out there in the world, feel free to make all kinds of um, comments on here on how to do it better. I mean, personally, you know, you could use dplyr with a mutate command, absolutely. But I want to keep it uber, uber simple for right now. Um, so we're just going to create a variable. And inside that variable, we're going to use the if else command. And what the if else command does is it's element by element. So it's going to look at each element inside of this variable food and it's gonna compare it to median income. All right, so I take the median of income, it's gonna compare it to that value, and then if that income is greater than median, it's going to store in that observation high in median income, and if it's less than, it's gonna store low. And if it's exactly equal, it's gonna store low. Um, but I don't think that's gonna happen very often. All right, and then the next thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna do a box plot. I like box plots for comparing um, values across categorical data because they just have lots and lots of information. You can talk more and look up uh, stuff about box plots, but it's really, really easy to see. I mean, I just look at the interquartile ranges. Boom, oh my goodness. The whiskers for low almost fit within the interquartile range for high. Okay, this looks pretty strong that we have some heteroscedasticity. Okay. I know, shocking based on what we've done so far, but people with high income or above the median income um, level seem to have a lot more variance in their spending than those below. There we go. So let's go look. And, and these are actual, the actual residuals, right? So that's why we'll have negative values down here. But remember, the variance of the residuals is also the same as the variance of the fitted values. So. We'll keep going. Boom. So let's do our Quanfeld test. Um, so this test is also a part of the LM tests. Um, um, and I, I said Quanfeld, Goldfeld Quant test. And if I'm pronouncing those wrong, I'm sorry. Um, basically, look at heteroscedasticity when we have when it can be partitioned into two groups. So at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to use a few things. First of all, I don't have to create that um, um, dummy variable to use the, the GQ test. And if you want all the details for the GQ test, I really recommend before you run it, just put question mark um, um, GQ test in the um, console of our studio and run that. And that'll give you the help file for GQ test. Um, you'll need to make sure you have the LM test library loaded first. Okay, and that'll give you all the wither twos and y fours. For now, what we want to do is I want to look at, well, I want to compare above the median to below the median. So I'm going to put in my model, easy peasy. Then I'm going to tell it a point. Now that's the point where I want to change. So point is point uh, five, or I want half the data to be below and half the data to be above. So that's just 50%. If I wanted like to compare the top 25%, all right, I could do 75, all right? Alternatively, I could change it around a little bit and do 0.252 and look at the lowest 25%. I mean, you know, there's lots of ways I could I could compare um, this kind of equivalently, but let's don't get too bogged down in there. That's just where do I want to split it into the two groups? Alternative, alternative just simply sets up the test. Um, so this is the alternative hypothesis. So here it's greater. Now here's the logic behind this greater than without the than. 
less than without the than or two dot sided. So if I want to know if test the, the null hypothesis that high income earners or income earners above the median have a greater uh, a greater degree of um, variability than those in the lower um, part or below the median, I'm going to use greater than. So the null is they're equal, equal to or less than. The um, alternative is that the um, high income earners are greater than. And that's what this is. If I wanted to do it the other way around, I wanted to test that the highest earners were less than, I'd use less. And if I wanted to equal to or not equal to, I'd do two dot sided. This is very, very similar to what you would see in t.test um, command, all right? The the t.test command, that's that's just part of, of base R. Okay, so, and then the final thing is I have to tell it how to order it. All right, so I'm gonna order it and take the top 50% in one pot and the bottom 50% and put them in the other, but I have to know in what order to know which one they belong to, so I'm gonna tell it to order it by food income, okay? and run this guy and I get my test. Here's my p-value. Now remember the null hypothesis, and we can see that from this, the null hypothesis is that they're equal. The alternative hypothesis in this case is that um, the high income earners are greater. Okay, and that's how that works. It's always gonna, this order by is always gonna go from smallest to biggest. So that's how I know that the alternative is that it's the biggest. And there you go. We reject the null hypothesis of no heteroscedasticity and find that, yes, we do have heteroscedasticity based on these segments. Great job, guys. I will see you in the next lecture.